All right, everyone. Uh, it's 10 a.m. I would like to introduce to you right now Dr. Kevin Huff. Welcome, Dr. Huff. We're happy to have you on. Thank you, Jerry, um, and thank you to Enhanced Vision for allowing to present on this topic again. Um, today's topic, adapting the visual impairment at home, at school, and in the workplace, um, is an important one. Uh, before we start, I would just say that the uh, um, presentation I have today, uh, in all honesty, a lot of what, what I have in this presentation um, is not the, the field of the low vision optometrist as it is the occupational therapist. Um, we have an occupational therapist on our staff here at Viewfinder, and, and a lot of what I'm presenting today I learned from her. And this brings up the point that as we're working to help people adapt to visual impairment, um, it is important that we take a team approach. Um, we all have our roles, and, and uh, um, but the ultimate goal for everybody that we're working with is to help them to adapt. Um, I have the lecture uh, broken up into three categories, um, at home, at school, and in the workplace. We're going to begin with at home. Um, and a lot of the same concepts that I'll be describing um, for the home can all also be applied to the school and the workplace. Um, so as we're going through the presentation, I, I hope it stimulates thought uh, in the minds of the people who are listening on, on ways that they can. Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. Adaptability is, is, I would say, the single biggest predictor of success when I'm working with patients. Uh, I'll often uh, meet a patient and start talking with them and asking my case history questions. And by the time I'm done, I, I sometimes have a pretty good feeling about, is this person going to be successful or not? Um, and Welcome to GoToWebinar. Web events made easy. It is something that I can't stress enough how important that is to the success of, of, of my patients, and people who are trying to adapt to visual impairment. Um, be surprised at how many times I've encountered through the years where um, we've produced options for patients that, that frankly are working for them, and then by the time we're done, they say, yeah, but I'll never use that because I don't want people seeing me with those thick glasses on. Um, and that kind of thing. And, and that's just something that we have to get past. Um, as we're talking about adapting, um, there's three main tools that we tend to use to help people with this adaptation. Um, the, the tools that I'll be discussing today are magnification, contrast, and illumination. Um, Gary, I'm hearing a little background noise. Sorry. Um, with magnification, there are four types of magnification that we can use. Um, they are relative size magnification, relative distance magnification, angular magnification, and electronic magnification. With relative size magnification, on the slide that I have right now, um, I have two different examples of it. One is the big picture of a phone that has big, large print numbers. And so what we've done is we've physically made those numbers bigger, and that has magnified them. Um, the other uh, example of it is on the title of the slide. I have relative size written twice, um, once in a font that's three times bigger than the other. And so to magnify something, one way to do it is to make it physically larger. Uh, relative distance is another uh, form of magnification. This is a picture of the same TV screen. Um, one is from about 20 feet away, and one of them is about 3 feet away. And so the, the size of the screen enlarges as you get closer to it. And so that's another form of magnification. Angular magnification is the term we use for when we're using optical aids, um, lenses that, that uh, bend light in a way that make the image larger uh, in your eye. And electronic magnification, um, we've been working on how to classify this type of magnification because in some ways it's, it's relative size, you're physically making it bigger, but you are using a, a device, a camera, um, to make it larger, so in that way it could be angular, but I, I tend to just call it electronic magnification. Contrast is obviously another very important tool for us. The reason contrast is helpful is that it helps with the ability to differentiate different objects or 
qualities within the object. Um, contrast uh, decreases with age and visual impairment. Um, and um, uh, the more visually impaired someone is, the more important enhancing their contrast is. And so some examples of the ways we enhance contrast, here's a picture of a coffee mug. Uh, the coffee mug on the upper left is white, and you can see the black coffee uh, filling up um, very easily. The coffee mug on the lower right um, is has a color to it, and so the, the black coffee is harder to see as it's filling up. Um, we can also enhance contrast sometimes by using different colored filters. These are some yellow looking glasses that we can put in to enhance contrast as well. Illumination, making things brighter, uh, increasing the lighting and decreasing glare um, can be an important tool. The reason lighting is important is lighting enhances contrast. When you use a good light, it makes the whites whiter and the blacks blacker. Uh, a person in their 80s requires nearly three times as much light as a 20-year-old when they're reading. Um, again, Jerry, I'm, I'm hearing that I don't know if everybody else is hearing that. Sorry about that. I'm hearing a lot of noise, right? I have no idea where it's coming from. If anybody, can everybody please, please press their mute button? A person who is visually impaired will need um, even more lighting than the average person. And, and that's something that I'm constantly uh, discussing with patients in exams, that um, I can do a, a really good job prescribing glasses and we can get everything right. If they don't use good lighting, they're just not going to see. You know, and that is a very, yeah. very important um, uh, tool that we have to keep in consideration. Um, when it comes to lighting, it's, it's sometimes people want to know what's the best light, and, and that's going to be very different for different people. Um, what I tell patients is we have to find what light is best for you, but we also have to make sure that we're positioning the light correctly. Um, I would say that's the biggest um, hindrance to getting good lighting is how people have um, light positioned. And so uh, this is a picture of someone using a, a very good light, but probably not a great uh, position. Uh, she has it behind her, and it's putting direct lighting on the paper, which is great. But when it's behind her, it's actually um, creating glare in her eyes. If she was wearing glasses, um, there would often be a reflection coming off the glasses from that. And so when we want someone to position their light, we actually like the light to be uh, directly in front of their face, putting direct light right on the paper. And that way, we're, we're getting that good direct illumination, but we're also not creating glare. Um, the closer the light is to the paper, uh, the brighter it's going to be. This is a picture of a newspaper. It's the same newspaper under the same light. The difference is on the top picture, uh, the, the light is 12 feet above the countertop that the paper is on. On the bottom picture, the same light is 12 inches from the page. And, and what you see is even though it's the same exact bulb, the, the bottom picture, the contrast, is much more white and black, much much better contrast. And so getting that lamp and getting that light into the right position um, can be very important. Now, sometimes we work on tasks that are very hard to get light in the right position. And so there are specialty task lights that are available, such as the one in the picture here, where we just attach it right to the, the head of the screwdriver so that someone who's um, trying to do a put in a screw on the electrical outlet here can see because the lighting is put right where that tip of the screwdriver is. Now with lighting, it's not just, again, brighter is better because if, if it creates glare, it can be a real problem. And so another part of an evaluation that we work with patients on and, and, and something that we always have to keep in mind is we do have to control glare. Typically, glare is controlled using different types of filters, different colored filters. Again, this is hard for me as the doctor to say, oh, you need a yellow one, and you need a brown one, or you need an orange one. It really comes down to the, to the person, and, and what we'll do is we'll create a, a different lighting situations and, and try different colors and see which one, one makes sometimes filters that are fit over glasses. Sometimes we do clip-on. Sometimes we do slip-in. And sometimes we'll just physically tint the glasses um, that someone has. And so those are the big tools that we're using, magnification, contrast, 
um, illumination, um, and glare control. Now, when it comes to adapting in the home, there are several goals that we, we always keep in mind. One is, obviously, one of the reasons we're working so hard to help someone adapt to their home environment is to help them stay independent. One of the biggest fears uh, when it comes to visual impairment is, um, how am I going to be able to be independent? How can I do things for myself? We also want to, obviously, uh, have someone have a safe environment. Um, and then, again, we want people to be able to enjoy life and enjoy what, what, what they're able to do. And so. What we're going to do is we're going to go a room-by-room room discussion in the home. Again, keep in mind as I'm talking about these things, uh, they're not tools that are only able to be used in the home. You can use some of these same things in the school and the workplace. Um, but to start off with, because when we think of the kitchen like and portable, um, some things that we can use. Found, this pocket-sized CCTV goes anywhere in the market, uh, even to work. Now. Amigo's large six and a half inch tiltable viewing screen gives you the flexibility to view images at a comfortable sure angle. Simply place the Amigo directly on reading material and adjust the digital magnification from 3.5 to 14 times. Connect to your TV for increased magnification. That's a your customer very service. Good advertisement of the Amigo running in the middle. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so, uh, in the kitchen we can uh, do to things like we can label grocery items and, and, and food items with large white labels. Enhanced Vision is the leading developer of innovative products for people who uh, are legally blind and have macular degeneration or well, other low vision conditions. We have helped through. thousands of people regain their visual independence by providing them the ability to read, write, watch TV, see the faces of their loved ones. Muted. Okay, I'm wondering if, if um, I'm still being heard. So we can uh, use the uh, um, felt tip markers to mark things, and, and the key to that is you want to use high contrast. Um, we also can do things like organize our products alphabetically on shelves. Um, we can carry uh, Liquid-filled pots, ice cube trays on rim, cookie sheets. That's a little trick that we learned uh, to make it so that you're less likely to just unmuted. Muted. Okay. We can also need to avoid um, loose-fitting clothes um, as we're walking around the stove. Um, for obvious reasons. In the kitchen we can also use things like large print materials. There's large print um, kitchen timers. There's uh, measuring cups with high contrast um, and also large print numbers on them. Um, we also tend to use electronic aids in the computer in the kitchen. Um, the Da Vinci is a desktop CCTV, um, but the advantage to it is, even though it's a desktop, it, 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 you can see that it's a pretty small fingerprint uh, or footprint on the uh, the countertop, and so uh, most counters it fits, and so you can put recipes and, and things underneath it. Um, nice thing about it, it has this very very um, high definition Sony camera, so that uh, even at the very low levels and at the higher levels magnification, it, it, it's still very clear. Um, the HD um, uh, camera um, has also really improved our ability to see colors. Um, the Da Vinci um, also has OCR technology, which is, has been a big leap forward for us because what it can do is it actually scans the paper and then it reads it out loud um, to you, reads it back to you. And you can change the speeds of that, you can change um, the voice that's used. And, and it's a very, very helpful thing when, when your uh, eyes are very tired and it's hard to, uh, to read something, you can just have the, the Da Vinci read it to you. Uh, the screen is a nice big 24 inch screen where you're able to get quite a bit of print even when it's magnified on the screen. Um, and there are a lot of different modes that you can use. 
Um, sometimes we'll use the Amigo in the kitchen. Um, and the reason it's very helpful is it's very portable. It can fit just about in any space that you're going to use. Um, it also has a screen that tilts, and that tilting mechanism makes it so that you can be um, working on what you're putting together in the kitchen um, and look over to the side, and that screen is just tilted to the exact right angle for you. It's the largest portable CCTV that we have available, and, and uh, that makes it so that it does um, give you a pretty large field of view, um, considering its portable nature. And, um, it can be connected to a TV monitor if you really need a large field of view, which is a helpful tool. Um, it also can freeze images. So if you need to take a picture of, of a recipe and bring it up closer to your eyes to see it a little better, then you're able to do that. Um, again, it's a high definition image. Uh, it can magnify all the way from three and a half times to 14 times. Um, in the screen, people, I, I have a lot of the specifications put into the lecture because that's typically what we get questions about at the end, so I'm trying to address some of that as we go. But the screen is about 6.5 inches, um, and it's an LCD screen, and, and it has a two-year warranty. Um, another portable CCT is the Pebble. As it is small enough to, to fit in the pocket, there's three different sizes. There's the 4.3-inch screen, the 3.5-inch screen, and the Pebble Mini. Um, some advantages to it is, again, it's, it's very small and lightweight, easy to carry. Um, the handle folds out so you can use it like a, a handheld magnifier. You can also prop the, the handle in a way where the screen props up and you're able to write underneath it. So if you do need to take a note or, or um, maybe underline something on a recipe, you can help with that. Um, and it can be used for just about any spotting task. So we can also use it to read stove dials and thermostat. So if you're you're wanting to see, you know, how what what temperature do I have this stove set at, it can help. And and you'll see in a moment that one of the tools we use to help with that is contrast and we can mark stove dials. But a lot of my patients are starting to have digital um, stove uh, um, controls. And so with those it's harder to mark and actually know. So you're actually going to have to have something that you can hold up to it to see. And that's where the the pebble is a nice one because you can hold it right up there. If you can't see it, you can also take a picture of it and bring it closer. Um, and again, the pebble comes in a three inch, a three and a half inch, and a four point three inch screen. Magnification goes times to ten times, and it gives a pretty big viewing area for as lightweight and small as it is. Um, when you factor in all the different magnification levels and contrast uh, colors that you can use, there's twenty eight different available viewing modes. And it does have a, a handle that folds in and out. It's got a two-year warranty. Now in the kitchen, um, on some of our stove dials, we can, if we're not going to use magnification, we can use contrast. This picture shows uh, two different types of stoves. The one on the left is what I would consider a pretty poor contrast. It's a white background with a very light gray um, writing on it. Uh, the one on the right um, you see the, the stove dial has black and white, and it's very, very high contrast, and so it makes it much easier to see. And so as you're choosing appliances, if you have that opportunity, um, keep, keep the contrast in mind. Um, we can also label uh, stove dials. Again, if, if you have a digital one, then you're going to have to use magnification. But if you don't, um, you see the, the picture on the right has shown where we, we've put a black dot on, on the part of the dial that actually is where you're lining what your your uh, temperature up on. And then the blue dot we put at medium and the red dot we put at high. And so someone knows, hey, if I want to put on medium, I just line up the black and the blue. Uh, if I want it somewhere between medium and high, I put it in between the blue and the red. It makes it a lot easier. Uh, we can also use contrast when we're actually eating. Um, this picture um, that I have here shows the same plate and uh, mug and, and silverware. Uh, the top one is placed on a blue mat, and the white plate um, is a very high contrast color difference from the blue, and so you can see where the plate ends. Um, on the bottom one, where we have a very nice, fancy lace placemat, it, as fancy as it is, it's not very useful because um, you can't see where the plate begins or where it ends. And so someone who is visually impaired is going to have a much easier time eating with the, the white plate on the blue. Uh, they even make uh, 
forks and knives with, with different um, contrasting handles, um, and that, that can help someone as well um, determine what they're, what they're about to grab. Um, we also have some dishes that, that our patients use where um, there's a dark side of the plate and a light side of the, side of the plate. We'll put their uh, mashed potatoes and the, the white um, potatoes and things like that on the dark part of the plate. And maybe they put their, their dark peas and carrots on the, on the white part of the plate. Um, this type of plate also has a, a raised rim for being able to scoop your food out without knocking it off on the plate, on the table. Um, we always tell people, you know, try to avoid clear plates or glasses because um, the fact is, is those are, are virtually invisible if your visual impairment is significant and, and you won't know if you're putting the food uh, on the plate or on the table at that point. Um, another way that we um, advise people to help with their eating is, is have a system. Um, whoever's um, helping you uh, by preparing meals for you or, or, or putting the food on the plate for you, if you just come up with a system that, hey, we're always going to put the meat at the 6 o'clock part of the plate and the starch, you know, potatoes, things like that, at the 9 o'clock position, and we'll put our vegetables at 3 o'clock. Um, and when they place it in front of you, then you'll always know where things are. And so that just kind of brings out uh, a concept of consistency. Um, the more consistent you can be with things throughout the house and throughout um, your environment, uh, the, the easier it is to adapt. Um, obviously, we also can control lighting when we're eating. Um, this is an area where we have suddenly had uh, many more tools at our disposal than we used to. Uh, we have a lot of our patients that are now carrying little portable task lamps um, with them, and they can set them up even in a dark restaurant and put light right on their plate so they can see what they're eating. The nice thing about them is they don't shoot light all over the, the, the restaurant and bother other people eating and so it makes it a lot easier. Um, in the kitchen, when you set up your kitchen, one of the things that we, we highly recommend is that if you're someone who has countertops um, and you have cabinets above them, um, having a good um, set of uh, lamps underneath the cabinets uh, can be a real helpful tool. Um, the problem with lighting in the kitchen often is when you're standing there, uh, we're, we're on something, our body blocks some of the light and casts a shadow on what you're working on. But if you're if you have the lights under the countertops, then you're not going to have to worry about the lighting getting blocked and, and shadows as much. Uh, we also can use other senses. There are talking meat thermometers. Um, we in our office um, we we are we do worry about safety with patients, and so when we do oven mitts, um, we have full arm ones so that. As you reach in, um, you're not as likely to bump uh, your forearm uh, on a hot part of the stove. Um, and then we always, again, being consistent, making sure that when you place something on the stove, turn the handles and hot, of hot pots and pans um, away from the edge of the stove so that you're not likely to walk by and bump it. Shifting gears into the bedroom, um, we have a picture here of a bed um, and a desk and a floor. Um, the nice thing about this bed is the, the covering on it is a very high contrast color to what the carpet is. Um, again, uh, there might be uh, decorating rules that say that that's not a great thing, but um, we can't worry about that. We need to make sure that we're, we're doing things in a safe way, and you can still make it look nice. Um, but the idea here is, is you're able to see right where that bed ends and where it starts because of the high contrast in colors. We also recommend that people consider keeping a, some form of nightlight on, um, on the, in the pathway from the, the bedroom to the, the bathroom. Um, and also, again, be organized. Just don't leave items out on the floor because you are more likely to be tripped. If you're someone who lives with someone who's visually impaired, be very respectful of that and, and, and really try hard to make sure that things get put away. And not only that they get put away, but they get put away in the same place every time. Um, I've had a lot of patients who have had very well-meaning uh, people come in and try to help them, and, and what they've done is they've reorganized their drawers, and then they leave, and, and the patient says, now I don't know where anything is, because it used to be where I had it, um, and now I don't know where it is. And so one of the keys is once you find where something goes, always make sure it goes there. And, and, and again, if you live with someone who's visually impaired, try your best to, uh, to respect that. Um, we recommend that when patients uh, are in their bedroom that they wear um, 
some loafer style slippers that have good traction on the bottoms because falling is, is something that we're very concerned with. Um, another thing that helps is if the, the slippers that you use are a high contrast with the floor um, that you have, whether it's a hardwood floor, um, if it's a dark hardwood, you would want lighter colored slippers. If you have carpets that are lighter, you want darker um, slippers. And so, and then always make sure that you do put them away when you take them off so you don't trip on them. The bathroom uh, can obviously be a very dangerous room. Uh, surfaces um, can be slippery and they're very hard. Um, and the other thing about the bathroom is there are a lot of very uh, reflective surfaces in the bathroom and, and that can create glare. Um, with the bathtub, some tricks that we have. Uh, one would be making sure that the, there is a textured non-skid bath mat um, of contrasting color on the floor of it so that you can um, judge how far away um, the bottom of the tub is um, and also not be as likely to slip as you're stepping out. Having grab bars um, on the walls is helpful and if you have grab bars, try to make sure that it is a contrasting color to what the wall is. Um, you can also, I, I've seen patients put a, a contrasting tape around the edge of the tub so that they can see um, where the tub ends and so when they're stepping over it, they're not as likely to, to trip on it. Um, or you can just drape a, a towel that has a different contrast uh, over the edge of the, the tub to, to make sure that you're able to step over it. Um, the color of soap that someone uses, it's helpful if that's uh, different than what the color of the bathtub or the bath mat is so that if it is dropped you can find it easier. Um, and then when people are, are filling their tub up, sometimes it's hard to know how, how high it is and, and uh, so we tell people don't be afraid to put a bright colored sponge in there and as it fills up you'll see it moving up and when it looks like it's high enough you can turn the water off. Um, this is a slide that we show. Um, and I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but the uh, high contrast of this uh, toilet seat on the right makes it a lot easier to, to see where the toilet ends and where it begins, and you're less likely to, to fall on your way there. Um, when you're brushing your teeth, it is helpful to use a toothbrush that's a contrasting color to what your countertops is. If you have um, brown countertop and you pick a brown toothbrush, it's going to be lost in that. But if you uh, have a light colored one in that situation, it would be a lot easier. Another tool that I once heard um, in, a, in a talk given by a patient who, who had macular degeneration, she stood up and, and told everybody in the audience, um, you know, one of the biggest moments for me when it came to regaining my independence was coming to the realization that I do not have to put the toothpaste on the toothbrush. There's no reason I couldn't just squirt some of it into my mouth and start brushing. And, and for her, uh, she talked about how that just really opened up her, her mind to a whole different world that if I just break these um, thoughts of I have to do things the way I always did and, and, and become willing to do things very different and think outside the box, then, then I can become much more uh, independent. And so I always thought that, that really stuck with me when she shared that with me because it's something that, frankly, I had never thought of, but, but it is true. There's no reason you couldn't just squirt the toothpaste in your mouth instead of trying to fight to get it just right on that, on that toothbrush. Um, in the bathroom, obviously, uh, grooming can be an important thing, um, and mirrors are very helpful for that. We have a lot of magnification mirror options um, that, that are mounted on the walls, or they can be put on the, on the countertops. Um, they can be with and without illumination. And, and magnification mirrors, you, know, they, you can find them up to 10 times. Now, we have electronic options, uh, the Da Vinci, and the Acrobat both have cameras that you can swivel to point at yourself. And, and the nice thing about it is the, the, the um, hardware within the um, machine flips the image around into a mirror image so that it, it will be the same as if you were uh, looking into a mirror and you can magnify yourself very large. And so a lot of our patients have, have uh, been able to become more independent in their ability to, to put makeup on and, and shave and, and do their grooming. Um, by looking at themselves through the, the electronic magnification that the Da Vinci and the Acrobat provide. Um, when it comes to taking medicine, obviously we want to make sure that people are taking the correct medicines and, and, and the correct dosages. Um, and so one of the things we recommend is when you get a medication, a new one, um, put a label on it and, and write very large and very bold print, you know, with a, with a felt tip marker 
um, what that is, and, and that makes it easier to know which one is which. Um, well, again, portable CCTVs can be real helpful with this. This is a picture of an Amigo uh, being held right up to a pill bottle, and the nice thing is, is it uh, makes those numbers, if you need to call in the prescription number, um, or call a pharmacy, or look again at what the instructions were, um, you can magnify it very large and, and uh, make it easier to see. Um, another thing is, is when you're putting pills out on the countertop, uh, it's sure a lot easier if you use a map that is a very contrasting color to the color of the pills. This picture shows on the left, there, believe it or not, there are white pills laid out on that countertop, but the contrast is so poor it's hard to see them. On the right, the uh, pills are very easy to identify where they are because they're a very high contrast color from, uh, from the gray mat. Um, we have a lot of patients with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy. Obviously, some concerns with that would be using um, the syringe and making sure that you're, you're um, getting the a correct amount into the syringe. And they have magnifiers that are built to made go right over syringes and fit right on them. Um, we also have large print registers to keep track of, of uh, your blood sugar levels and, and the amount of medicine you've been taking. And they also have talking blood sugar testers um, to make it so that you don't even have to read what it says, but it'll, it'll read it out to you. And again, um, using that sense of sound can be helpful. We have uh, talking pharmacists. These are um, where a pharmacist can actually record the name and the dosage of medications for you, and, and uh, then the medicine's placed inside um, the bottle so that you never even have to remember it. Um, they have uh, items that are available that actually can, can tell you um, scan things and tell you what, what items they are, too. Um, and then we have magnifiers that go right over bottles as well. Now, in living areas, in areas that you spend a lot of the time, um, we do recommend that you consider things like sharp edge tables and chairs really uh, are, are a danger if you fall or if you bump into them. And so if you can get uh, either round edge uh, tables or chairs, or they do have safety um, tools that you can put on the edges of sharp edge tables and things. We've, we've had to do that in my house, but not for the same reason. We have a, a one-year-old learning to walk, and so you go to the, babies, uh, the baby stores, and, and uh, they have uh, um, things you can buy to just put right on existing tables to make the edges soft and, and make it a little less dangerous. Um, again, keeping in the same um, context of what we've been speaking on the whole time is Furniture, the more it contrasts with the flooring beneath it, the easier it is to see. And, and in that sense, glass tables are one of the, the worst things for, for someone who is visually impaired because it, they just blend right into that environment and you're able to walk right into it, not even know that it's there. Um, using drapes and blinds and, and window coverings is very important to be able to regulate how much light is coming in and, and to protect yourself from glare. Um, and the other thing that's helpful is when those window coverings do contrast with the walls to make it easier to go find them when you want to make more light come in or less light come in. Uh, most falls on steps occur on the top step, okay? And, and so being able to see where that top step is and, and know that a step is coming uh, is very important. And so we do like people to either use paint or tape on the top and bottom steps and contrasting color for the outdoors. Um, for indoors, um, hopefully there's a way you can come up with to identify that, hey, I'm about to go to stairs. Um, and illuminating at least the top or the bottom steps can be a very helpful thing. Thankfully, uh, in, in our country, there are rules um, and regulations about how high steps um, can be, and, and so that way, most stairways that we find in our country are um, pretty consistent in how far you're having to step up. So if you can just see that first one or the bottom one, then uh, the top one or the bottom one, then you're able to kind of be able to take the rest of the steps. And now if you're in an older home or, uh, or in a, a country that doesn't have those regulations, you have to be a little more careful uh, about the steps because you never know how high they could be. Um, a lot of our patients will use theater, theater strip lighting on steps and, and, and um, having handrails that you can actually see that contrast the wall color can be a very helpful thing so that you know, hey, there, it's there and that you can grab it. This is a picture of a stairway where there are some theater-style lighting 
put into the, the, the steps um, to help the person uh, navigate up and down. And, and the other thing about this that's nice is the uh, handrails are a contrasting color to the carpet and to the walls. And when we're using appliances like the washer dryer, again, using labels um, and uh, different high contrast colors um, and stickers can make it easier. What we've done here is we've labeled, again, the, the part green on the knob where we want to um, point um, where, which setting we're on. Um, and we have the blue for cold and the red for the hot cold cycle. So if you want to use cold, you put it on the blue. If you want to use hot water, you put it on the red. And if you want it warm, you put it in between. And so, um, again, if you have a digital uh, display, then you're probably going to have to use a, a magnifier for that. Um, Another thing you can do in living areas is paint door frames in a high contrast color um, to the walls to help make greater visibility for where the doors are. Um, and then if you're in a room, if you have a room that's, that's not a bedroom or somewhere where we need privacy, just not having a door can make it a lot easier because um, you can get in and out with having to, without having to worry about the doorway. Uh, again, using contrast, um, you know, that's a common thing that you're I'm beating to death here, but it's so important. Um, here's a, a wall outlet, and um, this outlet is very nice on the right because the uh, the actual place where the plug is going is, is a very different color than the outlet plate. And so someone who is visually impaired is very likely to be able to tell because of that contrast from far away, hey, where is the outlet? And then once they go to put the plug in, it's easier to see where do the, the, the um, prongs on the plug go. Um, with the telephone, uh, obviously having a large print phone can be helpful. Um, and there are a lot of options out there now in, in large print phones and large print portable phones. Cell phones um, have the ability to have um, the, the print zoomed larger and smaller. Um, and even there's voice activation um, uh, settings on a lot of phones. Um, being able to put in memory um, on phones is important, so a lot of my patients have their phones programmed in, so they just have to push the, the memory button and then one, and they know that calls their, their children or, or whoever they're, they've programmed in there. Um, there's also, in, in most uh, cities and states, um, free 411 um, services, and, and what that is is you dial 411, the operator comes on, um, and you say, will you call this doctor's office for me? And they look up the phone number and they dial for you. Um, normally you would get charged for that. Um, but uh, most states um, and, and phone companies do allow visually impaired people uh, to use um, that service a certain amount of times per month for free. A lot of times it does require a doctor's signature uh, to get that service. Uh, writing is obviously a, an important task. And so with writing, uh, we're always telling people don't worry about using um, different types of paper. We have paper where the lines are spaced out further. And that makes it so that you can write bigger. The lines are very bold. Uh, we use felt tip pens. Um, there's a, a brand out there called 2020 pen that's very good because it's felt tip and it also doesn't bleed through the papers um, very much. Um, it produces a nice bold one. But you can find a lot of different options for that. Um, and then another way that people write uh, is they use magnifiers or CCTVs. I have an option, or uh, an example of a magnifier that someone writes under. Uh, the problem with the, the optical magnifiers is they do tend to be pretty weak. <coughs> Excuse me, because to get a magnifier that's large enough to get your hand under and that you can see a little bit, we just can't make them real strong. And so, so they're usually not much more than about three times, maybe four times power. Um, and, and they're a little awkward to use. Um, and that's where the CCTVs have been, have been very, very helpful. The Acrobat um, was one of the ones that I really liked when it first came out because uh, the open space underneath the camera made it very, very good for writing and taking notes. This is a picture of a, a student reading a book, and she also is able to, to take notes um, underneath this camera. And, and if she needs to point it up at the board, she can do that. And so very similar to the DaVinci, the Acrobat came first. Um, and it's a, a pretty lightweight desktop CCTV that can be moved from room to room. Um, and again, it can be pointed at yourself as a magnifying mirror as well. Um, but when it came out, it was, it was, a, it was a big shift in, in the industry because we had never had 
a desktop CCTV that was able to be uh, moved from one room to the other as easily as the Acrobat does. And, and practicing in, in Arizona, that's been a very helpful thing because a lot of our patients uh, spend the winter here and then they leave uh, for somewhere a little cooler during the summer and they were having to buy two CCTVs, one for each place, and, and a lot of our patients now are able to uh, just get the Acrobat or just get the Da Vinci, and it's very easy to, to travel with from one, one state to the other. Uh, again, the big feature on the Acrobat is that that camera head can move, and that allows for reading, writing, working with your hands. Um, it also allows for seeing your own face, like I said, and, and, and you can point it at other people. Um, one of the things that we've used um, this device with my grandfather who has macular degeneration a lot for is I have brought it over there and, and, and uh, we set it up and, and pointed at my daughters and, and he's able to see their face smiling at him. We've always been able to put pictures under his CCTV um, of the girls but when we actually get able to do it live and he can see them actually moving and smiling it's been a, it's been a pretty neat thing for him and then you can also point it off in the distance to see uh, presentations on boards and, and uh, um, bird feeders and, and neighbors and things like that. Um, the camera is autofocus, which is a helpful thing. And, and um, we have some patients who uh, will have um, several different acrobats, and you can detach that camera and move it around the different ones. Um, and you can have different size screen options, the different screen options. We, we really do stick more on the 24-inch size at this point because the field of view is so much better, um, even at high magnification levels. But some patients uh, prefer the 19-inch for uh, the weight, and also the, the cost is a little lower on those. Um, the uh, Acrobat also has features that the Da Vinci um, also has where there's line markers and um, object locators, and, and uh, you're able to isolate uh, lines um, by using those line markers. And, and again, there's a two-year warranty on the Acrobat as well. I'm going to shift gears a little bit and start talking about um, at school and adapting to visual impairment at school. Um, with school, one of the, the major keys to that, obviously, is uh, being able to have options that are portable um, because most of our students um, don't spend all day in one classroom anymore. Um, at the elementary school level, that, that might be the case, uh, but as you progress in school, it's less likely that you're going to be at the same workstation all day long. And so uh, the tools we need um, need to be able to be uh, transported from one place to another. Um, so because of that, when we talk about magnifiers, um, we can use optical magnifiers. Um, and, and those are very helpful if, if the visual impairment is um, uh, just beginning or moderate. Um, but when, when the visual impairment progresses, the advantages of a portable electronic magnifications just really trump uh, any advantage that we would have with the optical magnifier and make it so that, that most of our students were hopefully able to get them um, into electronic magnification. And this is a slide that kind of shows some of the differences between using an optical magnifier, which, which is a lens, um, and an electronic magnifier. And, and nice thing about an electronic magnifier like a pebble, you can adjust the magnification levels. Um, to different levels depending on what size print that you're presented. If you're presented something in large print, you don't want a real strong magnification level because then you're narrowing the field of view more than you would really need to. Um, but if you're presented something in very small print, you need to be able to see um, a large magnification. And so um, being able to adjust that's important. Um, also uh, having the different ability to change the contrast. If someone presents a student um, uh, reading material that's in poor contrast, uh, they're able to enhance that by changing the colors. Um, being able to freeze an image, um, if they want to walk up and, and take a picture of something and bring it closer, they're able to see um, small, small print items that way. Um, and being able to pop it up and write underneath it, that's something that's very difficult um, with, with um, optical magnifiers, obviously, and, and adjusting the brightness can be a, a, an advantage as well. Um, again, the pebble, um, this is a picture of a student reading um, from a, a magazine or a textbook, um, and it's a very, very portable, easy thing they can carry around with them in their backpack. And one thing that's, that's been nice for our students as well is with the electronic magnification, there is um, a less of a stigma to using it. Um, I've had a lot of my 
students who have flat out told me I'm not going to use that because people think it's weird when, when I present them with different magnifiers and, and options like that, but I've never once had a student say that about electronic magnifier because, frankly, gadgets are fun and other students are not only not um, going to make fun of them for it, they're probably going to ask them if they can use it too um, because it is a fun little tool to play with. And so the Amigo is another one that we do a lot in school. Um, it's a little bigger to carry around, um, but if that if visual impairment um, is more significant, then they're going to need that bigger field of view. And so um, we do a lot with the Amigo with students as well. The transformer, um, frankly, is, is the option that we tend to go with the most for our high school and college age students. And, and the reason for that is it is essentially a desktop CCTV that, that is extremely portable. Um, the picture here uh, shows how it works. It, it, it connects to a computer um, and uses the computer's monitor as the screen. Uh, and the nice thing about that is a lot of our patients who are students um, do have access to laptops if they don't. Um, we, we try to get them that access. Um, but the nice thing is you can carry that around. You can uh, um, have it as your screen. If, if they're, they can make it split screen, it, it comes up in a, in a Windows um, window, and so you can make it minimize it, make it bigger. Um, you can also split screen it. Um, and the other nice thing about the transform is you can capture images. And so here's a picture of it folded up. Um, Again, it's even more portable than, than any other desktop option that we have, and, and it's able to capture images. Um, it weighs less than three pounds, so again, very easy to carry around. Uh, the magnification range is, is very large. It can be anywhere from about 2.4 times to 30 times magnification. Now, that's calculated based on the assumption that someone's using a 17-inch screen. If you're using a larger screen than that, um, your laptop or your computer is bigger than that, then those magnification levels actually get bigger. Um, the camera can rotate um, 330 degrees, which allows for reading, distance, and again, it can be used for self-viewing for putting on makeup or, or grooming. Um, it connects to a laptop, desktop, computer, or a monitor. Um, it has 28 custom color selected modes, and it's battery opera operated. It, it can operate up to four hours on a charge. And it has built-in LED lighting, so even if the room that the student is in, the lights are down, so you can still read underneath it. Um, and the, the software to make it work is plug and play, so you just have to plug it in through a USB port, and, and, and it starts working right away for you. It's a two-year warranty. Again, this, is, this has been a big step forward for us. Uh, again, we have a lot of patients who you know, had real difficulty taking notes in big lecture settings, and the fact that they can um, point this camera up at the, the board full of notes, take a picture of it, capture that image, and then later go back to uh, scan um, the notes has, has made note taking much easier for patients. Uh, telescopes are, are something that we do use for distance vision um, when we aren't able to get the student into an Acrobat or a Da Vinci or a Transformer where they can point off in the distance. And so telescopes, uh, there's three main types. There's spectacle mounted, um, ones that are actual glasses. There's handheld, um, where they're a monocular telescope you hold up. And then there's also bioptic telescopes, which sit right above the eye. Um, and they can be used for um, distance vision. We can also focus them up closer with a computer and music. Um, but the, the big drawback to telescopes um, would be field of view. Uh, this is a picture of uh, our parking lot, um, and there's some trucks um, that on the left are just how far away we are normally with our normal vision, and then through the right, the picture on the right is through a telescope, and, and so it brings those trucks bigger and closer, but you also see less field of view. You see less of the picture, and, and that's, that's the, the challenge with telescopes is we need to make it strong enough that someone can see, but not too strong where it's more narrow than it needs to be. Now, a lot of our students do very well with bioptic telescopes, and the idea with them is they're mounted into the glasses, and so they sit right above the eye, and so when a patient needs to see um, writing on a board or a menu in a restaurant that's up on a wall, all they have to do is tilt their chin down, 
and they can look through that scope. The nice thing about these bioptics is it's a very steady view, much steadier than a handheld monocular. Um, and some patients are even able to use them for, for driving and, and walking around them. Um, when it comes to uh, helping students, we can also use what I described before as relative size magnification, and, and, and that's as simple as making sure that students are receiving large print materials when they're available. And, and whether that's Xeroxing and, and larger print or just making sure that if there is a book that a student is assigned to read, that, that if it comes in a large print um, option that we get that. Um, we're having more and more options available to us now that there are um, e-readers available where we can zoom prints up on books. And so that's been a very helpful thing. We can also use relative distance magnification in the school. Um, basically, visually impaired students should be given preferential seating in the classroom. And the example I've given is if a student is sitting 20 feet away from a whiteboard where the teacher is writing on the notes, and they move their desk up to five feet away, um, all those letters on the board are now going to be four times larger um, because they've, they've come four times closer. And so um, allowing students to sit up in the front of class um, does make a big difference. Um, and the other thing about relative distance magnification, a lot of our students, because they're young and they're able to use accommodation where their lens flexes in their eye, they can create uh, essentially a microscope in their eye by holding uh, material very close to their eyes. And so you'll find that a lot of students will use very short working distances. They'll hold reading material just a few inches from their eyes. And, and instinctively, uh, those of us who are not visually impaired, that, that just seems like, boy, that's, that's got to hurt. That, that can't be good for them. And so, unfortunately, a lot of well-meaning uh, teachers have, have told students that they're not allowed to do that. And, and, and we have to make sure that, that that doesn't get out there, that that's the case. Um, it is very much okay for students to bring material closer um, when they're reading. Now, some of our patients... Um, it, it is going to be hard on them and they're going to experience, experience eye fatigue and, and there's things we can do from a glasses standpoint to, to prevent that or to lessen that. Um, but it is important that we are allowing students to use that shorter working distance because when they do that, they're creating relative distance magnification. Contrast, obviously at school, is important. Uh, it can also be harder to control. Um, Again, just try to keep in mind all the basic concepts of contrast that we talked about um, for the home and, and, and try to apply them to the school as much as possible. Obviously, it's not um, realistic that we're going to have every school in the country redesign um, their doorways and how everything's set up. But the more we can um, help students, um, the better. Um, and teachers should really be taught this and, and help to be made aware when they have um, patients who are visually impaired in their class, it, it's very helpful if someone talks to them about the fact that when they present materials, if they can really do their best to, to present them in, in high contrast, um, that could help a lot. Uh, we have a lot of very creative teachers out there, uh, and, and sometimes, again, um, as, as well-meaning and, and creative as they are, if, if they're presenting materials on the board, in, in, in a, I, I've seen people try to write on whiteboards with a, a yellow uh, marker and, and that white and yellow is just not enough of a contrast for people to, to, to see. And, and so the more uh, teachers can try to be very aware of that, the, the better they'll be able to help their, their visually impaired students succeed in school. Um, portable task lamps uh, can be helpful. Um, this is a picture of some playing cards, which aren't usually used in school too much, hopefully, but um, it is just getting the point across that we have very small portable um, lamps that can be carried around that can help students um, control their lighting uh, situations um, in school. Obviously, we also want to be able to control glare. And so students should be allowed to use tinted lenses when necessary. Um, so if a, if a student has to wear sunglasses indoors, they should be allowed to. Um, and we should also, if, if a classroom has windows, um, we should be uh, either using blinds to help control that glare or allowing students to sit facing away from the windows so that the glare isn't, isn't bothering them. Now shifting gears to work. Um, when it comes to, to work environments, the, the challenge there is that um, different jobs vary very greatly as far as what tools are needed. 
You know, someone working out in a construction site is going to need different tools than someone working in an office cubicle. And so um, someone who has a job or at the same desk every single day uh, might need different tools than a home health uh, care worker who is traveling in the people's homes. And so we have to tailor um, our options for work depending on, well, what your work is. Um, and so to do that, um, there's often a work assessment that's necessary. And, 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 and what that is is someone actually goes to the work environment and assesses, okay, these are the challenges, these are the tools that are needed, and these are what's going to help best. As the low vision optometrist, we don't tend to go out into workplaces and do these work assessments. We need other professionals, occupational therapists, CLVTs, um, and, and the whole other uh, group of people who help with visual, uh, visually impaired clients. Um, and so, but what I can do as the doctor is say, okay, these are what options are available, but then we need another professional to actually work with someone to, to decide, you know, what um, are the, the best options in this exact um, situation. The um, electronic magnification really is um, one of the most important tools when it comes to uh, helping someone in a work environment. Um, since we have gotten better and better with these CCTVs and electronic magnification, uh, we really are helping people be a lot more efficient at school. This is a picture of the Merlin HD OCR Elite. Um, the nice thing about the Merlin Elite is it does have the OCR technology, so if someone is uh, severely visually impaired or if their eyes are very tired at the end of the day and they don't want to read, um, papers and, and words and, and read camera, um, which has really made these CCTVs dramatically better because, again, at the lower magnification levels and at the higher magnification levels, we're getting a very crisp image. Um, if the Merlin Elite, uh, the 24-inch uh, screen is the, the one that's used. Um, and, again, just like most of these, there are 28 viewing modes when you consider all the different um, magnification levels and, and uh, color schemes. Um, uh, the um, screen can also move up and down and side to side to, to make it so that you can get into a comfortable viewing position. The Amigo, um, we use that one a lot um, for patients who um, have jobs that are very uh, high intense as far as the data entry. Um, because it can be rested on a paper and the hands can be free to, to type as they're entering data into a computer. When it comes to actual help with the computer, there's really four variables that we can use. Um, we can make it a bigger monitor. That's relative size magnification. We can use bigger print on the monitor, i.e. zooming the print up. And again, that's relative size magnification. We can also change the distance a person is from the monitor. Um, meaning if you're sitting and your monitor is 24 inches away, if we can get you 12 inches away, that's made it twice the size. The key to that is we have to prescribe glasses that allow you to sit 12 inches away and be comfortable. And then we can also enhance the contrast materials on screens. Um, the Merlin LCD Plus uh, is a computer that, or a CCTV that works with, um, or that is PC compatible. Um, and so this is a picture of it using a split screen where half the screen is what's under the camera, the book, and the other half is the computer screen. Um, and um, that's a very helpful tool, again, for data entry situations where you don't want to have to be looking from one screen to the other. Um, that, that, that split screen capability um, is very helpful. It can also be set up to have a toggle capability where there's a a little foot pedal and you can push on it and it toggles back and forth between um, the computer screen and the screen that's provided by the camera, by what's under the camera. And so the LCD Plus is a, is a very, very um, big tool for us when it comes to work environments because of the ability to work with someone's computer. And it has a lot of the same features as, as what the other Merlins have. Again, when it comes to work, we just really make sure that people, you know, don't forget these concepts that we've talked about with contrast and illumination. You just have to control illumination by making things brighter and also decreasing glare. Um, 
and, and also just making sure that you're, you're enhancing contrast when you can. When it comes to work, another situation that we have to be very aware of, in school it's more worried about kids being teased about what they're using. In work, I have a lot of patients who are hesitant to use uh, tools like CCTVs and, and, and the other things that we've talked about uh, because they're concerned that if someone sees them using that, then they're going to get fired. And, and um, in our country, we do have uh, laws protecting people uh, through the American Disability Act um, from that, but, but different states have different rules too, and, and it is something that we have to balance uh, getting someone the help they need, but at the same time not um, creating reason for um, supervisors who don't know any better to have a reason to discriminate against, against our patient. But again, a lot of that comes down to really educating people. And, and I, I actually had this discussion with one of my patients this week because, frankly, he was um, he had told me he's just not going to do any of the um, adaptations that we had talked about because of fear for his job. And, and I said, well, you know, you came to me because you're you're having trouble performing at your job, and, and I feel like if we don't do something, then, then you're going to go down that road anyway because your efficiency has decreased. And so um, if a supervisor can really see that, hey, I can produce um, at a pretty efficient level when I'm allowed to use the tools um, that, I, that, I'm, that I need, then I, most um, people are pretty reasonable about that. But, but it is something that, that can be a, a difficult situation, and, and, and there are organizations um, available to help people um, when when they are wrongfully fired for um, simply having to use uh, um, tools that are available. And so so just make sure that um, you work with, uh, like I said, some of the professionals that are out there to help um, with visually impaired uh, clients um, or with low vision optometrists to, to make sure that you are getting the tools you need and that you're also being protected um, from uh, being discriminated against because of the visual impairment in the workplace. Now that's all I have. Um, I, I do appreciate everybody uh, listening um, and being here for this. Um, uh, if you've heard about some of these items and you are interested in it, there are um, ability to get um, no obligation in-home demonstrations through enhanced Hello? Yes, Jerry. Oh, hi. I'm sorry. I got cut off for a second. Hi, Dr. Hoff. Thank you for the, for the very informative presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, sorry for everybody in the beginning where we had that noise issue, but I think we got that taken care of. And we do have some questions, Dr. Huff, for you. Okay. Uh, first question, is it advantage, advantageous to take vitamins like eye caps, um, Ocuvite, or excuse how I'm saying this, uh, preserve vision if you have glaucoma and macular degeneration? Uh, those vitamins, um, there is a, a, a pretty strong amount of evidence that when you take vitamins that are based on what we call the AIRREDS formula, age-related eye disease study, um, that and you have macular degeneration, that those vitamins can help slow the progression of macular degeneration down. Um, there's never been any evidence that those vitamins help with glaucoma. Um, now, as far as which one is the best, Occupite, Preservision, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of different options out there. Um, it's hard for me to say which one is the best. That's something that you'll want to consult with your uh, retinal specialist or your ophthalmologist or optometrist about which one truly is the right one for you to be taking. Um, but at this point, it's pretty well established and well accepted that taking vitamins when you have macular de degeneration can be helpful in slowing the progression of the disease down. Thank you. Um, second question is, if a student is light sensitive, does additional lighting help? And please give some examples. Well, and that's that balance that we're always trying to find. Of, it, it, you know, I have a lot of patients who are, are very, very sensitive to light. And so we have to use uh, tinted lenses, you know, whether it's glasses um, or slip-ins behind their glasses or fit-overs, where we're, we're controlling the glare that way. But at the same time, um, just making things with no light and eliminating all light, you have to have enough light to see. And so um, creating a, an environment where the light can be placed in a direction and an angle where it's not creating glare in their eyes, um, and then maybe using a, a different colored tint to help control that glare can be helpful. But again, 
it, it's just that balance, and, and this is where uh, it is very individual as far as how much light is needed versus how much uh, protection from light is needed. So. Okay, another question is, where do you purchase a light that attaches to a screwdriver? <laughs> well, um, most uh, cities or states in the, in the country, you can find um, low vision um, stores or offices, and, and, and most people will carry those. Um, and any more, we're getting more and more, some of these things are showing up in um, hobby stores. Um, there's a lot of good lighting options in the hobby stores that, around the country, and then also in some of the, the home improvement stores. Um, you can find them, but, but the, the easiest way to find them is usually in, in an office that, that um, does help patients with uh, low vision. Okay, uh, next question is, on stairs, when the material is the same as the flooring, I have problems with depth perception. Do you have a strategy for that as well as escalators? Well, escalators are always going to be a challenge. Hopefully that the most escalators, you, you will see where they have contrast tape around the edges of them where, where the escalator starts and where it begins, but that's not always the case. Um, and so in that case, you almost have to have someone who's going to help you. Um, with, with stairs um, in the home, sometimes having a, a carpeted runner um, on them that's a high contrast color um, can help. Stairs outdoors, um, usually what we would say is um, there are concrete paints and things you can um, use to um, paint the, the, the stairs different contrasting colors. But, but indoors, um, if, you, if you can't change the color of the flooring and you can't change the walls around it and the rails, then having a, a, a carpeted runner that goes down the stairs um, can also help with traction too, but, but making sure that it's a different contrast than the color can help. Okay, next question is, does the pebble throw a shadow when writing under it? Um, technically, typically no. We, we just don't have much trouble with that. The, the lighting is angled in a way where um, when people are writing, there's not really any shadows. And then we have a question uh, about Zoom text. When, when, I don't know if you would know this, because I don't, but when could we expect an upgrade on Zoom text keyboard for the Mac? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer for that. Now, the Macs tend to have um, pretty good accessibility built into them, but you know, for people who use Zoom text and, and, and products like that, um, you know, they are even better than what's built in on the operating systems, but I don't have any knowledge as to when, when that's going to happen. Um, so the best thing you can do with the Mac right now is just work within the accessibility options that are, that are already built into it. Okay, great. Um, somebody just typed in, let everybody know, Zoom Text for Mac is available, okay. um, and AI Squared has released it. So if anybody okay. needs that, that's some good information for you. And that's something where, you know, as a doctor, I do rely quite heavily on our technology specialists to help with that because um, those things change quite a bit. And, and, and we have um, in our office um, both an occupational therapist who helps with that and also we have a, a, a um, technology consultant who helps with those things too. Okay, great. Um, I have another question, and it's in-home in demos are great, but is there a way to test a unit? For a few days or a week, often the person doing the demo knows the product very well, but I find that I learn better if I'm able to use it on my own environment. There are situations I might not be may think of during a demo, but will arise when I am working with a product. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> all Enhanced Vision products have a 30-day money-back guarantee, um, so if the product doesn't work for you, um, or you're not comfortable with it, or you want to try a different product, you're always free to for those 30 days in your home. So I just wanted to let you know that. And, and I'll add to that, Jerry. I know uh, that's something that's been really helpful because the, the, the person who wrote that question, that's a question that comes up quite a bit. And, and for as much money as someone's investing in these things, they, they want to make sure it's going to work. Um, that 30-day guarantee, it is just, so rare. I, I can't remember the last one where we actually had one return once someone actually got it. Um, so it's it's a nice safety net to have that. But frankly, once once we get it in someone's home and they start using it, they, we just don't get them returned very much. Great. Then we have one more question. Can a person take 
too many vitamins for eyes. I have, I take, I'm sorry again, PERS Vision, uh, Lutein, fish oil, and DHA. I had MD dry and wet, plus I'm colorblind. Yes. Um, there is a, a such thing as, as too much of a good thing. Now, what you were describing, they're all different things, which is good. Um, you do have to watch some of the, the preservations that are available now do have some of those things that you don't want to double up on them. Um, the actual dosages of each different thing, lutein and, and fish oil that are that are best, we're still working that out some. Um, where, I, where I get nervous is when I have patients who are taking a, a formula that's based on the AIRREDS formula and they're also taking um, multivitamins um, that have a lot of the same ingredients. Um, we do have to be careful of that. As we're getting more accepting of vitamins as medical treatments and, and the research is getting stronger, we're learning things. Um, we've learned that when you take too high a dose of beta carotene and you smoke or you've smoked within the last five years, it can increase your chance at lung cancer. And so obviously we don't want to do that. And so taking too much of that as a recent smoker can be a problem. Um, another example is there's some rumblings recently that maybe taking too much zinc um, can um, make someone more prone to dementia and, and Alzheimer's. And so those are things that we haven't established yet. But um, if you're taking uh, an eye vitamin that has uh, 40 milligrams of zinc and then you're also taking multivitamins that have large amounts of zinc, um, that could be something we want to avoid. And so um, one of the things that's started is the AIRREDS number two study to follow up follow up to the original AIRREDS study where they are looking into how much zinc do we need um, to make it um, useful. Can we take the beta carotene out and still have it helpful? And then they're also looking at lutein and zeanthanin and fish oil and seeing how effective they are and also how much of it do we need. So these answers are coming, we just are still working on it. But the, 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 the short answer is yes, you can take too much and that's why you want to consult with your your eye doctor or your primary care doctor to, to make sure that it's okay. Okay, well thank you so much Dr. Haas for this great informative presentation. We appreciate it very much. Okay. Um, for everybody out there, um, the presentation will be up on YouTube tomorrow. Um, you just go to Enhanced Vision USA or just type Enhanced Vision in and it will take you right to our YouTube channel where you can view the entire webinar. So again, thank you all for your time. We appreciate it and especially to you, Dr. Huff, for another great webinar. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you, Jerry. You're welcome. Bye-bye.